hello, hello. And welcome to another broadcast of Things We Said Today. This is a bi-weekly uh, talk show on the Fab Four, where we talk about the Beatles years as a group, the solo years, any part of Beatle history that we feel like. Their music, singles, albums, important events in their lives, what's going on in the news. We tackle it all here on this show. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the three regular co-hosts known for my syndicated Beatles show, Every Little Thing. Also another talk show podcast, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, and my YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio. Being joined by my regulars, a mainstay in New York radio for 40 years at New York's WFUV, Darren DeVivo. Hi, Darren. Hey, what's happening? And we have Alan Cozen, who's written a number of Beatle books, including the highly acclaimed new one, should be number one on the bestsellers list as far as I'm concerned, The McCartney Legacy. What's that? Yeah, me too. <laughs> Here it is. <laughs> and it covers uh, the years 1969 through 1973, volume one of several volumes about to come out. And hi, Alan. Hey, Ken. Hello, Darren. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello, everyone. I Just really appreciate your introduction, Ken, all the time, including me as one of your irregular hosts, because I'm a regular host, because <laughs> I'm waiting to become an irregular host on the show. So, hmm. OK, well, I was going to work that in anyway um, into the show. But uh, yeah, so the three of us are here. By the way, Happy New Year to all you watching. This is our first broadcast for 2023, hoping that it's going to be a real good one for Beatle fans. And on the show this time out, we're going to be talking about songs that the Beatles wrote and gave to other artists. Um, and we've come up with a list of five or more that we feel represent the best or favorites of ours. And uh, I'll be curious to see the choices that we all came up with. It was impossible for me to limit it to just five. I have something like, I think, 15 here. But uh, <laughs> there's so much music that the Beatles gave to other people. And it's an, another important part of their history. It's a lot of songs that were hits for other artists, songs that you may not be aware of that uh, might be buried on an album somewhere uh, by an artist you never heard of or a famous one. Um, it's kind of scattered in that in that regard. But uh, we're going to be talking about many of those songs uh, that the Beatles wrote and gave to other artists in the music industry. And um, we're going to be doing that in just a few moments. But before we do, we have, of course, the latest in Beatle news, which is kind of brief. It's usually kind of slow at the beginning of every year. We'll start with the news that both John Lennon and Paul McCartney made an appearance on Billboard's Hot 100 in the top 40 with their Christmas classics. Paul's Wonderful Christmas Time uh, re-entered a couple weeks ago at number 32. It's since dropped to 33. Um, and last year, I think it was, it hit number 28. John and Yoko's Happy Christmas War is Over entered the top 40 for the very first time last week at number 38 and dropped since then. As crazy as it sounds, even though we've heard the songs millions of times, the both staples at Christmas time on the radio, when Happy Christmas War is Over came out, when Wonderful Christmas Time first came out, they never charted on Billboard's Hot 100. I know that's hard to believe, <laughs> but now in recent years, they've been doing something different on the Hot 100. Christmas songs re-enter all the time. Every year, Mariah Carey has a number one hit. <laughs> well, she's the queen of Christmas. Uh, well, I guess so at this point. Um, it's a very strange thing. This is a, a policy that they that they uh, adopted a few years ago. And the good side about that is, is that a lot of older songs make it back on the charts. In fact, I just read Nat King Cole's The Christmas Song is in the top 10, his first top 10 in 60 years. Mm -hmm. But the flip side of that is that so many artists that are on the charts are artists that normally don't get any more airplay, even on oldies radio anymore. People like Brenda Lee or Bobby Helms. And yet, at the end of every year now, 
they'll chart fairly high. In some cases, the top 10. Brenda Lee is number two with Rocket Around the Christmas Tree. And it's a shame that the only time you'll ever hear any of these people, whether it's Brenda Lee, Andy Williams, <laughs> you know, it's only at Christmas time. But look at this. Both John and Paul made the top 40 with their with their classic songs. I'm happy to see that happen. And um, I also have been told that those two songs were at number 17, Paul and John at Paul at 17, John at 24 on the UK charts with their Christmas songs. Now, this may not be an impressive number to some people, but despite having only 3,000 copies made, the Paul McCartney singles box set selling for over $600 made Billboard's top 200 album charts, debuting at number 126 and then sinking to 200. Also appearing on the album charts in the last couple of weeks are John's compilation of Gimme Some Truth, McCartney 2, as well as Revolver and Abbey Road. Give Me Some Truth and McCartney 2 have been on the charts. Why? Because they're good. Obvious. <laughs> well, besides that. Oh. Give Me Some Truth has Happy Christmas. McCartney 2 has Wonderful Christmas Time. It's nice to see that kind of representation on uh, Billboard's top 200 album charts. You know, I um, had heard something a long time ago. I think one of the reasons why, like Paul's Christmas single and John and Yoko's Christmas single didn't, show up on the charts and really very few Christmas singles. I, I don't know this for a fact, but very few Christmas singles tended to show up is because of the way reporting was done decades ago. And when mm. a Christmas single would come out sometimes weeks before Christmas, it's not like today where the 2023 Christmas albums are coming out next month. Uh, uh, but back in the day, like these singles would come out at the tail end of November, early December there was no time that once the holiday was over, the sales ended um, and the numbers were reported and they weren't big enough to impact the charts. So they'd never show up. And I think that I think the singles actually. Christmas songs, radio was different. I don't mm -hmm. you know, like I never remember hearing Wonderful Christmas Time on the radio for years. Really? And I never heard it in 79. I never remember hearing it. And. Um, it was a weird thing that I didn't even know the single was out. Um, and I think I was a member of the Wings Fun Club at the time. But the but the mailings tended to be extremely slow, if I remember correctly, coming over from the UK. Mm. I walked in a store, a convenience store, with uh, my mom. I was 14 years old, and there's Paul McCartney with a Santa hat in a little cardboard display on the counter. Mm. And this. You know, I, I didn't know it was out. I never heard it on the radio. But, uh, yeah, I, Christmas music's treated totally different today than it was back in the day. So the fact that these songs are just starting to make dents on the regular charts is and maybe isn't really surprising. But not anyway, only that, on. yeah, um, it's at least 10 years ago, could even be 20 years ago, they started having radio stations play all christmas and that would yeah. be sometimes even you know maybe around thanksgiving time yeah through christmas so i think constantly hearing the songs and now because streaming is so popular right. it makes it easier for these songs to chart right. and to chart high right so on the one hand i'm thrilled to see nat king cole in the top 10 you know one of the greatest singers of all time as far as i'm concerned i love his voice I love seeing Andy Williams on the charts and Brenda Lee, but it's such a shame that it's only because it's their Christmas music that gets played. But still, be grateful for even that. Um, in an article in Yahoo from December 29th titled The 15 Best Posthumous Albums Ever Released, it is nice to see that George Harrison's Brainwashed made the list at number nine in this category. Our friends, the Weaklings, are planning on putting out a series of singles this year, which will eventually result in releasing an album. The first single coming out will be their cover of the Beatles song, I've Just Seen a Face, which comes out January 17th. A little shout out to Joe Scarborough, the host of MSNBC's Morning Joe, who just interviewed the legendary Neil Sedaka. 
And I always said if I interviewed Neil, the first thing I was going to bring up is a song that he wrote sort of as a tribute to John Lennon, which is called The Immigrant. And um, he wrote that song as a response to John's struggles to have a green card. And um, that was the follow up single to Laughter in the Rain for him. It is actually it was a top 40 hit, top 10 on the adult contemporary charts and a great song. And just the fact that Joe knew about that, I thought was very cool. And he got him to talk about the rest of his career, how he started out as a Brill building writer, you know, early hits in the early 60s. And then his big comeback in the 70s being on Elton John's label. If we I'm not three... mistaken, yeah. I didn't mean to cut you off. If I'm not mistaken here in the in the U.S., I think the immigrant was the B-side of the Laughter in the Rain single. No, it was the second I single. I had it. Back in really? the day. Huh. And I'm looking it up now. Now, I see what you mean here, because here it's listed separately. Um, but I could I could swear I had a copy of it, because that that little career renaissance for Neil Sedaka hmm. was sort of like a little, it was in slow motion. He had already started making some inroads with contemporary stuff in the UK that was then coming out here in the US, sort of like on in delay. You know the album, hmm. the album laughter. There, there, there was an album, the album laughter in the rain. No, Sadak is back. Sadak is back. Right. Sadak is back was actually a compilation of material from a couple of his recent UK albums that I think were hits, uh, but hadn't caught on here yet. And Elton John was involved in, you know, okay, getting that album out. It's on Elton's label, and yeah, I'm could I could swear. Because I had the single that was the B-side of Laughter in the Rain from Sadaka's Back. But they were also individually released. So We'll have to look it up. I interrupt again. Don't, That's don't okay. <laughs> so we have three passings to discuss here on the show. Uh, fashion designer and punk rock innovator Vivian Westwood passed away at the age of 81. Rolling Stone wrote that Westwood popularized punk's iconic style and her pivotal work with Sex Pistols manager Malcolm McLaren uh, broke through the status quo by challenging fashion and the people who wore it to break our preconceptions of beauty. Both Paul and Stella McCartney pay tribute to Westwood online. Uh, Paul said goodbye, Vivian Westwood, uh, a ballsy lady who rocked the fashion world and stood defiantly for what was right. Love, Paul. On Instagram, Stella said, thank you, Dame Vivian West, uh, Westwood, for all you gave us. You will live on forever. Punk rock will never die. Of course, we mourn the passing of broadcasting legend Barbara Walters, a trailblazer who paved the way for women in broadcasting, co-hosting daily newscasts like 2020, the Today Show, the ABC Evening News, creating and producing the daily all-women talk show, The View, for which originally she was a co-host, and perhaps will best be known for having many TV specials with probing one-on-one -on -one interviews, often asking very tough questions. Barbara was the first person to interview any of the Beatles after John Lennon died, when she interviewed Ringo shortly after that. Paul's wife, Nancy Cheval, and Barbara, happened to be cousins and uh barbara attended paul and nancy's wedding paul paid tribute to barbara with this message on twitter nancy and i are so saddened by the news of her dear uh cousin barbara walters passing the two of them enjoyed a deep loving relationship over many years and i was proud to share some of those special moments barbara was an amazing woman who more than held her own in the early days of male dominated television and went on to become a worldwide celebrity known for her many perceptive interviews with stars from every walk of life we will miss her but always remember her with great fondness barbara walters was 93 god bless her and then finally the passing of ted king size taylor Ted was part of the Liverpool group, King Size Taylor and the Dominoes. And as lead singer, he was known for being one of the best singers on the Liverpool scene. 
They started performing at the Cavern Club in January of 1961, and Cilla Black was featured as a singer with the group until the following year. In the summer of 62, the band played at the Star Club in Hamburg, and Taylor is best known for recording the Beatles there on Real to Real tapes. That was in December of 62. That's how we got live at the Star Club. King Size Taylor and the Dominoes were on several record labels in Germany, doing all cover versions of rock songs. They later toured in the UK, backing up Chuck Berry and Carl Perkins in 1964. Ted Taylor was 83. Kind of an important person there because he wouldn't have life at the Star Club without him. And we also know that the Beatles tried to block the release of that. George Harrison showing up in court to do that. And George talking about you know, being crummy recordings in terms of sound quality and all. But we have to be grateful <laughs> for the historical importance of those recordings because we have so little from those days. Mm -hmm. The capture of the Beatles live. Right. So uh, there you go. That's it for Beatle News. Okay. So, I have um, an item. Oh, that's right. You have something you yes, wanted I to add. I have an item for Beatle News. Now, we're recording this on Wednesday. Uh, 4th of January. So I think, you know, m many of you will be watching this um, by this first weekend of January. Uh, on Sunday, January 8th, the Kennedys will be celebrating Paul McCartney's birthday. Now, the Kennedys are Pete and Maura Kennedy, um, two exceptionally talented singer, songwriters, and guitarists, husband and wife. They've been making music uh, together as the Kennedys since the early 90s. And uh, they have a thing, a live stream that they do regularly. And on Sunday at 2 o'clock, uh, the Kennedys will celebrate Paul McCartney. Live stream number 131, it says here, go to kennedysmusic.com. So that's um, the Kennedys, Pete and Maura Kennedy. Uh, they met when they were... I think they were both in Nancy Griffith's band back in the day. And uh, they got married and formed a musical partnership that continues today. And uh, so that's Sunday the 8th, 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, the Kennedys celebrate uh, Paul McCartney. Go to kennedysmusic.com. So that's my Very talk. good. I'm going to try and see that. Very good. Darren, thanks so much. Right. So our main topic on the show this time are songs that the Beatles wrote for other artists. And, um, you know, I've been in that kind of mood lately, having been reading Chris Engelhart's new book, Fully Uncovered, which which really tackles everything, not just songs the Beatles wrote for other artists, but songs that they produced for others or played on for others. But here we're talking specifically about the songwriting aspect. And there's a lot of material there to discover and some of it you know if you if you want to investigate that area you might find a lot of it to be very enjoyable some very strong songs that they gave to other people and even if you're talking about during the Beatle years when they were together there's quite a lot of stuff that they gave in particular to other artists that were managed by Brian Epstein but we're going to get uh, five or more songs we're never going to be able to get to all these songs there's so much that the Beatles have done and still continue to do um, to this day between Paul and Ringo. And um, so it's going to be five or more from each of us. And I thought we'd start with Alan. OK, um, I made kind of an amorphous list and um, I think I, I I put check marks next to some of them, but I'll sort of, you know, pick from uh Going back to the Beatles days, I mean, I, I didn't pick many of these because we all know them so well. And um, but but there are a few of them that really, really stand up for me. And I wanted to mention um, principally World Without Love, which Paul wrote for Peter and Gordon. One of, I think, three things he did for them. Also, Nobody I Know and Woman written. That's four. There's four. There's four. Well, there's, so there's also I Don't Want to See You Again. Oh, right. Right. OK, um, <clears throat> so, you know, they obviously had a uh, a pretty good connection with Paul, seeing as he was going out with Jane Asher, who was Peter's sister. Um, and he gave them a bunch of stuff, which in, in, in some ways is 
really a lot of their best work. Although I, I still kind of like Lady Godiva a lot. That was a, that was a fun <laughs> single, and uh, and there are other things that they did that were were fine. But really, World Without Love is sort of up at the top. So that's my first one. Um, I'll be on my way. Um, that was a. You know, the Beatles did it on the BBC, but that was really fundamentally a demo, you know. Um, and what was that, Billy J. Kramer? Yes, and the Dakotas recorded right. it. Yeah. Um, you know, good song. Uh, the Beatles themselves, I can see why they didn't want to put it on one of their albums, work it up for, you know, beyond the BBC performance, because, uh, you know, everyone always made a big deal about how, they always avoided rhymes like June and Moon, and this song has a rhyme of June and Moon. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe that was maybe that was the thing. But uh, but I I still like it. It's I it's a nice song, um, and you know it has that the Beatles version of it has that uh, you know it's it's the one unreleased Lennon McCartney song that's in that whole BBC archive. So right. that has a special place. Um, I'll leave it at that for Beatle era ones and go on to Paul McCartney solo ones since he really was the most prolific of, of the Beatles writing for other people. Um, six o'clock for Ringo. I mean, that's just a beautiful song. Mm -hmm. uh, and he did, uh, he did quite a number uh, of, of songs for Ringo, but, um, that to me is is the top of the list. Um, Mine for me for Rod Stewart, mm -hmm. really good song. And I think that, uh, you know, this was at a period uh, after Ram. Uh, and in fact, after really the 73 tour or the 73 British tour uh, where he ran, he, 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 did an interview uh, where he said, you know, I'd, I'd write for anybody who wants me to write a song. I'd write for Rod Stewart, you know, and Rod Stewart then came to the tour ending after party and went up to him and said, I want you to write a song for me. <laughs> so Paul did. And then, and that's in that period in between, you know, Red Rose Speedway and Band on the Run, um, shortly before Band on the Run, really. Um, he wrote it and it's, um, it really... I think suits Rod Stewart really well because while on one hand the the general theme of the song, which is that you know, well, other women leave me alone because I've got my girl who I'm going back to, is not really a Rod Stewart quality as mm. as we think of him. But there was that line, you know, he comes off stage and he says, you know, sweet painted lady, it's not going to happen now, you know. Uh, <laughs> and that sweet painted lady thing is is a, is a total Rod Stewart image, you know. That's the kind of people he normally sang about, you know, groupies and, you know, people he's just having a great time with. And um, but so he's uh, he's he's sort of putting a, a Paul McCartney approach onto Rod Stewart. And I think it works. It also suits his voice really well. I, I can uh, imagine that when he was writing that song, he, he really wrote it specifically for Rod's style. Um, so let's see, <clears throat> go back a little earlier. And this is actually during the Beatles era, but it's not really a, ever meant to have been a Beatles song, which is Goodbye. Uh, mm. for Mary Hopkin. Um, he did a demo of it that was included on, um, I guess that was in Anthology, wasn't it? Sure, yeah. Yeah, I think if it is being... More no, 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 it, it was it was in Abbey Road. It they was... didn't include it on the in the Beatles Anthology. That was in the yeah. Abbey Road oh. box set. Okay, so I think of it as having been on Sessions, which it was. Uh, okay. <laughs> and Anthology, you know, I've sort of... Uh, sort of put that aside in a way because all the best stuff from anthology has come out in better versions since then, or at least for the albums that they've done, you know, mm. from Pepper on to a revolver on now. Um, but that's a, that was a really nice song. I mean, I remember um, at the time it came out, uh, you know, those were the days was a huge hit, but you didn't know if Mary Hopkin was going to be someone who would 
you know, be with us for any length of time. And, um, you know, we all sort of followed the Apple roster as it was, and we're interested in it because it was Apple, because it was, you know, to do with the Beatles. And in her case, mm. because Paul was producing. And so the next thing she comes out with is, is goodbye, which really is a beautiful song. Um, you know, that, that McCartney uh, melodic engine driving it. It's, it's just great. And it suits her voice too. Uh, mm-hmm. so, let's see. Okay. And one, oh, two more from Paul. It's all right. Um, you can keep going. Them, yeah. One of them is on the wings of a nightingale for the Everly brothers. Yep. Mm-hmm. So there is a McCartney mm-hmm. demo of that. It's I, I've never found it in really, really, really good quality. It's okay. There's an yeah. okay quality one out there, but it could be better. Um, but the Everly Brothers one is quite good too. So, uh, you know, but that's a, a beautiful song. And, uh, you know, it, it, it sort of opens up to the kind of harmonies that the Everly's did um, suits them very well. This is the thing about, you know, with, with, with Paul writing for other people, he really seems to have kept in mind what their style was, what their strength was, and, you know, and would write to those strengths if he was writing for someone specific, which brings me to the last one from Paul, which is if I take you home tonight, Diana Krall, that's just a pretty recent one. Recent dish is what, 10 years old. Um, (laughs) But, uh, you know, Diana Krall, an incredible jazz singer, married to Elvis Costello. Um, and that song is totally in that style that is her sort of, you know, sweet spot in a way, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are the Paul ones. For John, um, all I really had was rock and roll people. I mean, unless you think of um, some of the ones from the sort of, you know, deco audition days that other Liverpool groups were given, like Hello Little Girl, that kind of mm. thing. I can't think of too much that John wrote for other people. There's Mucho Mungo for Harry Nilsson. Um, but to me, Rock and Roll People was was the best of the relatively few, um, just because it has a lot of energy. Uh, I don't, you know, Johnny Winter did it. Um, don't think of it so much as a, you know right on target Johnny Winter song as such. Um, But it's, you know, it's not miles away from rock and roll hoochie coo, you know, which I still don't think is, you know, know, (laughs) central John. I I think of, I think of Johnny Winter's best stuff as stuff like Black Hat Bone on the very first album, I think before the Columbia album, you know, that kind of stuff, the really good blue stuff. Um, but rock and roll people was fun and it was, it was a good track. Uh, I've got nothing from Ringo for other people. Mm-hmm. Um, ideally, one of you will tell me something <laughs> about that. Um, <laughs> and I've got three from George, um, which I think brings my total of 10, by the way. Um, Sour Milk Sea, you know, Jackie Lomax, um, pretty much the same kind of thing I said about Mary Hopkin, you know, as an Apple artist, we were really sort of focused on Apple artists and what they were going to do. Sour Milk Sea, George wrote for him and produced uh, his album, I think, and and produced this mm. single at least. Um, so there's that. Uh, Run So Far for from Eric Clapton. George, they did put out a George version on Brainwashed, but the Eric Clapton version predates that one. So I'm sure. guessing that the one on Brainwashed might have originally been George's demo. You know, I don't know. Or maybe it was his demo and then he fixed it up. Or maybe he just liked it. Eric Clapton's version of it and decided to do one of his own. But in any case, I figure it, it should count because Clapton's version came out, you know, before George's. So it's not like just a cover of a George song. It's written for Clapton. Um, it, it's a good track. It's on Journeyman, I think. And yep. uh, um, yeah. And finally, The Hold Up by David Bromberg. Oh. And that is a um, uh, Harrison Bl- Bromberg collaboration. Yeah. Um, and now, I've never really been a big David Bromberg fan. I, I really, yeah, I don't like his voice that much. I mean, it, it just sounds so 
warbly and weak and um but he's a really good guitarist and that song is kind of funny um and you know it just sort of describes a hold up and uh you know some funny lines in it like you know wealth is disease wealth is disease and i am the cure <laughs> you know um i've seen some comments about the song as being sort of a, an update of tax man but it, it's not really i mean he, he mentions taxes at one point but he's not really writing about a tax collector he's writing about an actual robber um robbing them mm. um, in a hold up and uh you know it's a, a nice sort of you know folk style kind of track and that of i think of all the things i mentioned i think that's the one that probably gets the least play out there so i thought it'd have at least something moderately rare and uh so that's my list Okay. First of all, um, we should also point out that these could be songs that weren't necessarily written for the artist. Mm. They could just be songs that were hanging around for a while. Right. You know, like, for example, um, uh, Love of the Loved. Right. Um, which was given to Silla Black. The Beatles had already done that for their Deco Audition recording. And so... Um, there came that time when, when I guess Brian asked John and Paul, can you give Scylla some material? And so they had that one laying around. A World Without Love is a song that wasn't written with the intention of Peter and Gordon to begin with, because most of the song had already been written. The verses had been written. The only thing that wasn't, uh, what, what needed to be completed was the bridge. Oh. And Peter Asher was familiar with what Paul had written for it. It had been an older song and he said, can you finish it up? And he did. It just so happens that it worked out perfectly for Peter and Gordon. Sure. So, uh, yeah. But the other three songs that Paul wrote for Peter and Gordon were with them in mind. And uh, their harmonies are just so perfect for the songs that, that Paul wrote. But um, another thing that I, I think we should bring up here is that I wanted it to be songs that um, were not collaborations with the Beatles together like you couldn't include photograph because George and Ringo wrote it together it's not like George wrote it for Ringo and even though we know that George helped out with the Duncan Easy it's a collaboration between the two of them so by the same token we can also accept songs I guess that a Beatle co-wrote with somebody else other than a Beatle because she mentioned the hold up yeah. so yeah and um, when we were trying to just to to come up with a plan for this show i said well you got to put badge in there how can you not put badge in this list which george wrote with eric clapton it's such a classic song now so i think you know those are the rules to follow if it's a beetle writing with some someone other than a beetle we can accept that okay so um some great choices there alan thank you and uh darren you are next did you hear Alan's uh, suggestions? <laughs> Those were mine. On to you, Ken. <laughs> no, yeah, actually, right. yeah, I, I was feeling so excited and good about what I picked. Some of these things, ha, ah, this is a good one. And Alan's popping them out there left and right. Sorry, um, but that happens to me when I'm I'm the third. That's, <laughs> okay. That's a, okay. So what I did, I didn't really start off with any rhyme or reason. Uh, I like all the songs. I was started out trying to come up with five and I, I picked an odd number. I don't even know how many I have here. It's not 10. Um, one, two, three, four, five, I think seven. Uh, and it's a combination of everything um, that Alan was talking about. And it's practically all of Alan's songs also. But um, first up, though, was one that Alan didn't mention. And that means a lot. Uh, is a song that uh, was written by John and Paul, although... You know, as usual, the Lennon-McCartney songwriting credit isn't necessarily indicative of the fact that the two of them wrote it. That Means a Lot was first uh, recorded by PJ. It was a Proby? PJ Proby. Proby. Okay, I was, I was, I've always wondered if it was Proby or Proby, but I've always said PJ Proby. And uh, he released it in 1965, written by Lennon-McCartney. George Martin arranged and conducted P.J. Proby's version. 
Uh, and we uh, did get to hear the Beatles do it when it came out on the Beatles Anthology 2. 2. Uh, so that means a lot. What I wanted to pick, uh, but then I realized that um, it didn't qualify, um, was If if You Got Troubles, uh, which I love that song. Uh, but that was not written. Now, what was, what was the deal? Lennon McCartney wrote that. Right. Yeah. That was during the help sessions and they decided it, it wasn't good enough. Right. And that was it. It just sat yeah. there. It didn't go off to another artist. Right. So I was but all that, like that. That was the first one I went to because I was getting confused thinking maybe Billy J. Kramer did it. And I'm looking around. I'm going, no, I think that was one that just actually sat in the can uh, after the Beatles rejected it. It's a song that gets a lot of criticism and a lot of people feel it justifiably remained unreleased i always like that song um well the couplet you think i'm soft in the head will try someone softer instead may have made it sort of not quite the lennon mccartney standard <laughs> but yet by today's darren devivo standard in 2023 that's a great lyric you're yeah. soft in the head pal <laughs> uh anyway so my first pick was uh then that means a lot uh, which was always, uh, you know, these songs, you listen to them and you're going, these are tunes that would, that John and Paul just, yeah, eh, you know what I mean? And these were great songs. Um, uh, th that means a lot being one of them that went off to another artist. Hey, Darren, I just wanted to, to say that, well, both If You've Got Troubles and That Means A Lot were both from the help sessions. Yes, yes. And they were both great. rejected by the Beatles. And I know Paul himself hated that means a lot. Hmm. I mean, he referred to it as shite. But that was one of his. <laughs> so well, <laughs> he could be critical of himself. In that instance, when I was putting the list together, the first thing I went for or went towards was uh, if you've got troubles. And mm -hmm. then realized, no, that was one that was not picked up by another artist. Uh, that means a lot was like second or third in my head. And so I started my list off with that one. Mm. Uh, I will admit if I've heard PJ Proby's version of it, it's once or twice and it has not been, it, it was a long time ago because I don't remember it. Um, so anyway, so that's one. Uh, then I picked rock and roll people, which Alan did. John Lennon wrote it for Johnny Winter and he, John's version of it. Uh, which I guess remained sort of in the demo phase, um, ended up coming out on Men Love Avenue in 1986. Uh, but when John wrote the tune, it went to Johnny Winter in 1974 and was on the John Dawson Winter the Third album. Um, and Edgar was playing on it, and Rick Derringer, of course. Uh, and I always thought it was a cool tune, but like Alan said, you know, it was sort of an ordinary rock song. That uh, worked for Johnny Winter. It worked for John Lennon. There's nothing really overly imaginative about it. It's just a good tune. Um, that was the second one I picked, Rock and Roll People, again, on John's Men Love Avenue. Uh, this one, I'm surprised Alan didn't mention, unless I blacked out for a minute while Alan was talking, and that was Come and Get It. Nope, I didn't. And to me, that's one of the greatest power pop songs in the history of the world. And and amazes me that it's ridiculously simple, but it's ridiculously catchy. And these were the kinds of things that like Paul would belch out at night, like without any effort. Boom, here's a song. Pow, here's another one. And I may I hope I'm getting my facts right here. I I've often I, you you read things through the years and sometimes they get twisted up and I thought I had read somewhere that back in 69, you know, when Alan Klein had his paws all over Apple, that the Ivies felt like they were kind of getting the short end of the stick at Apple. Uh, their album, Maybe Tomorrow, wasn't released in the U.S. or U.K. And I think it was Ron Griffiths um, felt like the band was kind of getting lost in the shuffle at Apple, what seemed on paper to be. Uh, a, a dream come true to get to record for the Beatles label has been a bit frustrating, had been a bit frustrating for them. 
Uh, maybe tomorrow came out just a single in the U.S. and U.K., but the album only turned up in a few countries, and uh, and and it wasn't either the U.S. or the U.K. As a response to that, somehow, and I don't know if Paul got the band involved in contributing music to the soundtrack of the Magic Christian, with "Come and Get It" being the song targeted to be the movie's theme song. Now, I've always, uh, I don't know if I've twisted two different things together there that McCartney responded to. I think it was Ron Griffith's comment in an interview uh, and feeling that, yeah, maybe the guys felt feel like they're getting forgotten about. Here, uh, here's this song, Come and Get It. And you can uh, also do some of your own songs for the soundtrack to this movie that Ringo's uh, starring in with Peter Sellers. So I don't know if either one of you could dispute that or if I'm right. But um, silence maybe means... He was, commissioned to write, <laughs> he was commissioned to write two songs for the soundtrack, and I think they expected him to record them. Um, and they he only wrote the one and wanted to give it to Badfinger, possibly for the reason you said. I, I, I can't remember that myself, but it, but it kind of makes sense. Um and then he recorded the demo, you know, in an hour at Abbey Road Studios. Yeah, right, 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 right. And so come and get it. Paul wrote it. They were still the Ivies when they recorded it. Um, uh, Joey Molland wasn't in the band yet. Uh, Ron Griffith still was. And uh, then Ron got fired uh, from the group. And the band changed their name to Badfinger. And right at the very, very end of December, 69, it came out as a single in the UK, and I think like a week later in early January in the US, produced and written by Paul McCartney, Come and Get It, Boom, and Badfinger have their first hit, and what a way to start. And um, I did get mixed up when you mentioned Goodbye, and I said it was on Anthology 3, Come and Get It, the demo of Come and Get It is on Anthology 3, Goodbye mm -hmm. isn't. So... Uh, so my third song, "Come and Get It," uh, which then would be on the Magic Christian Music album from from Bad Finger, which was an Apple creation and the one, was also soundtrack to the movie. Yeah. The one thing I remember about "Come and Get It" is that Paul, after he made the demo, he said to the band, "Play it exactly like this." Yeah, he gave strict instructions, and they did. It was as close as could be to Paul's demo, and it worked out well for them. And they did I, different versions with a different. I think they did one with Pete Ham on lead. Uh, Tom Evans is the lead singer on the version that came out. I don't know if Ron Griffiths got a, a turn. Uh, just Paul was testing out whose voice worked better. Um, and of course, it was the Tom Evans one um, that, uh, well, the only one actually that did get released mm -hmm. was with Tom Evans up front. And. Um, Okay, so that's my third song, number four. And I was so excited about picking this because I'm like, these they won't remember this song run so far. <laughs> uh, from Eric Clapton, uh, from the Journeyman album. An album that uh, has always been praised as one of Clapton's better solo albums. I always found it a little bland. And I was a big Clapton fan. Uh, but I made sure I got Journeyman pretty close to the album when the album came out in 1989 because it had a quote unquote new George Harrison song on it, and George played on that song, and that was Run So Far. And then it was uh, uh, interesting to see it that George had his own version of it, and it was included on Brainwashed posthumously. So run so far. And I think the versions, if I remember correctly, it's been a while since I've heard them both. They're fairly the same. You know, Clapton Clapton did his version or or George did his, whoever recorded it second, a lot like the way the first one went down. Well, it was written for Eric. Yeah. It was definitely with Eric in mind. So and uh, then uh, the next one I picked was, I think, one that I thought everyone's going to pick this. This might be the perfect example of what this show's about, A World Without Love, um, which was the first single for Peter and Gordon, which I don't think I knew that. I, I thought they might have had one or two singles before that, but that was their first and was the title track of their uh, debut album here in the U.S. 
and uh, the first album was self-titled over in the UK. So I don't, I'm not going to go on anymore with a world without love because Alan covered it. Um, Alan covered the next two as well. Uh, <laughs> Sour Milk Sea is a song I always loved and always thought it should have been a bigger hit for Jackie Lomax, but probably got lost in the shuffle because everybody in Radio Land was playing Hey Jude and Those Were the Days. Um, yeah. I'm tempted to say everybody like ran like gangbusters for the Black Dyke Mills Band single. Uh, but uh, no, I that was um, Sour Milk <laughs> Sea. Uh, written by George in India. George demoed it, correct? Mm -hmm. But didn't really get, as we've heard so often, all that much, you know, interest from the other Beatles, namely John and Paul. And Sour Mil Milk Sea didn't really get any anywhere uh, in in consideration for the White Album. And uh, Jackie Lomax was given the song, and Jackie recorded it, and it was. Jackie's first Apple single and ended up on, on the album. Uh, is this what you want? Uh, the single came out in 68. It was one of the first four Apple releases, which were all singles. And uh, in, in late August 68, and then it was on Jackie's only album for Apple uh, before he went on, I believe the Warner brothers after that. And I mean, the lineup of who's playing on the song is it's Jackie, of course, George Harrison, Eric Clapton, Nicky Hopkins, Paul McCartney, and Ringo Starr. That's one hell of a band. And George produced it. I don't know if Jackie Lomax co-produced it, but George was uh, the, you know, George. the production credit, I think. And then the last one was Goodbye, um, which is interesting because Mary Hopkins really jumped out of the gate with two big hits and, 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 and figured that Come and Get It a little later on was a hit. You know, Apple, the very promising start for Apple. Of course, the Beatles, anything they put out was going to be a hit. Uh, but yet, Goodbye, other than if you take away Bad Fingers' later singles, No Matter What, Baby Blue, Day After Day, Goodbye, I think it's safe to say, was maybe the last significant hit that Apple had by an artist other than the Beatles together or solo. Uh, I don't know if Goodbye hit the top 10 in the U.S., but it, it, it didn't. It didn't, but it, it, it was a number two hit in the U.K. Right. But it went top and 20 after, in America. After that, other than what Badfinger accomplished, Goodbye was it in the way of big hits on Apple, right? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I think Govinda did make some noise in the UK, the Radha Krishna Temple single. Mm -hmm. But that was that was it. And it's interesting because in the, this case, Mary Hopkin came out, boom, those were the days. Huge. Goodbye. Huge. And nothing. That was it. It's over. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, like come and get it. Goodbye is one of those things where McCartney sits down and boom. Here comes another little classic melody, uh, beautifully sung by Mary. Well, there were other singles that Apple released for Mary Hopkin. That oh, yeah. Didn't do that well. But they really tried to make her an international star by having her songs sung in different languages. Mm -hmm. And she also did a version of Que Sera, Sera which Paul and Ringo are on. And, right. Yeah. Um, but these weren't big. These weren't yeah. genuine can't miss hit singles. Right. And there were some other good records that came out, of course. We, we mentioned uh, um, The Cell Milk Sea and James Taylor's single. And, you know, I don't know. I don't know how Billy Preston didn't get more, um, you know, airplay slash sales with his Apple output. But right. he didn't. And uh, so that's it. So those are my songs. My not, let me let me rephrase that. Those are Alan's songs. Most I stole. Um, uh, and uh, now we toss it off to Ken. It's just that you know, great minds think alike, Darren. That's well, okay, it made me feel better. There you go. <sighs> okay, um, I'm gonna start with well, a song that all three of us will have on our list, and that's A World Without Love. Copy I don't Ken. know how you how can you not include that? I mean, it was a number one hit in the U.S., 
And it's really a song where everything flows together so well. And I I always remember John in particular really rejected that song. He didn't want the Beatles to do it just because of the opening line, please lock me away. I guess that would have been a little bit too dramatic <laughs> uh, a line um, you know, in I a pop the, song. I bet in the 1970s, John would have liked that line. <laughs> You know, it it just it, he he would have had a, a a quirkier spin on it later on, right? <laughs> but the thing about the Peter and Gordon singles, I love all four of them. The Paul wrote four of them. Um, it's just that their their vocals, their harmonies are really nice. They worked so well for those songs. Um, I had to include the fourth single from them, and that's "Woman," which I really think is a masterpiece. Um, between that and a world without love i i don't know which one tops the other but um it's a beautiful melody it's ranged rather well i'm pretty sure because i've interviewed peter a few times paul had nothing to do with the sessions at all um but the arrangement of it worked so well um you know with the brass and the orchestra and um the vocal lines going back and forth the um i've got plenty of time repeated it just everything worked together so well on that arrangement i think that song really deserves a lot of merit there i had to put bad to me in there i mean um that's kind of billy j kramer's signature song and john wrote it for him um billy j had the benefit of having john and paul give him songs and um, they're all pretty good. Bad to me is another one that I could hear the Beatles do. You know, that's another thing. Uh, there's, uh, I don't necessarily want to call it a, a phenomenon, but there's a there's a heavy interest in these these early Lennon McCartney songs that they gave to other people with artists, bands that are kind of Beatles tribute bands like Apple Jam and the Weaklings, and they do their own Beatles arrangements how the beatles would do these songs and some of them work very well as beatles songs bad to me i think would be one of them easily course, um is, i want the beatles acoustic demo of bad to me out there that's true that's true but um you know i'm sure that there are a lot of fans who envisioned what would it sound like for some of these songs that that they wrote for peter and gordon and billy J and Silla black and other nems artists you know, how, what would it be like if the Beatles did them? And that's what those bands like the Weaklings and, and Apple Jam are really good at, um, among other things. I wanted to put Scylla Black in there. And I'm really fascinated, more fascinated now with the song It's For You, because I think the way that Paul wrote for Scylla, it was more of a theatrical song. Mm -hmm. It's more the kind of a song that I could hear a Shirley Bassey sing, you know, um, there's that part in the song, you know, they say that love is a lie. Da -da -da -da, da -da 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 -da. It's it's um very different from your typical pop song, a little bit more complicated, I would say. And so I think Paul wrote wrote it with that in mind. Um and Scylla had the chops to sing it really well. Um, by the same token, there's step inside love which Paul wrote for Scylla, which was used for a, a TV theme. Mm -hmm. And that really has like a jazz feel to it. So it is very different what he wrote, what Paul wrote for, for Scylla Black. I'm not going to put Love of the Love in that category, because like I said before, the Beatles had already done it. I doubt Paul had Scylla in mind when Love of the Love was written. Um, so I wanted to include those songs. For John, I actually put God Save Us in there which went to um, Bill Elliott and the Elastic Oz Band. I think it's a great rock song altogether. Originally, God Save Oz. It was uh, a charity single to benefit uh, an underground magazine. And um, yeah, and John recorded his version. Um, and Bill Elliott has the single version, which is on Apple. And I love it. I think it's a solid rock song altogether. Um, so I would definitely put that in the category. Come and get it's got to be in there. It's a perfect pop song. You know, one or two listens and you're hooked. I'm glad that Paul's done it live, although just a few times in Europe. Um, Sarah Milk C is also in my list. What you said, Darren, you, you nailed it with that band. Who wouldn't want a band like that? 
it's a good edgy song that worked really well for for jackie lomax um i also had to put six o'clock in there which i think is the best song any of the beatles ever wrote for ringo and um it's a perfect pop song fits ringo's vocal range perfectly wonderful melody the whole arrangement in there is wonderful the whole um that uh synthesizer solo in the middle i love uh the great build up towards the end it's um i don't know what can you say it's one of so many songs paul just dashes off <laughs> and it could be one of the greatest songs of his career in this case for ringo um Really tough to pick. I wanted to put a song that John wrote for Ringo. And yeah, I love I'm the Greatest, but I've always liked Good Night Vienna the most. I think that's a really cooking song and a great opening track for the album. I love the whole keyboard part and all the synthesizers that are in there. Um, very catchy and, you know, perfect for Ringo. Um, I had to put Badge in there. What can you say about Badge? It's become a classic rock song. And it's one that Eric Clapton's done many times in concert for that reason. I think he's very proud of it. Got that great bass part from Jack Bruce in there to kick off the song. Um, no, I love it. And, uh, you know, it's nice to know that there's a Harrison Clapton composition out there that the two of them wrote together with a little help from Ringo. You know, he came up with one of the lines. I told you about the swans that they live in the park came from Ringo. Um, I wanted to put Try Some Buy Some in there, even though George recorded it. It was originally written for Ronnie Spector. I've always loved that song. A very unusual, very complicated, complex song with a lot of different um, tempo changes in it and uh, real difficult to sing in a very high register. And I think it worked very well for Ronnie. Um, yeah, Fourth of July I wanted to put in there as well. Mm -hmm. from john christie which um you know i have these memories from having bought the book all together now which was my introduction to beatles side projects and seeing songs that they wrote for other people and seeing this listing of fourth of july never having heard it and i would go to the fest for beetle fans and look in the flea market and see if there's some way i can get a copy of fourth of july now of course you can go on youtube and listen to it and paul's demo of the song which i never even knew existed ended up on venus and mars it's a really beautiful song and um they're only the only time they work together. John Christie, who was a, a protege of uh, Dave Clark Five, um, did some work on the, the Time soundtrack that Dave Clark put together. Uh, John Christie was a part of that, as was Julian Lennon. Um, and I also had to put On the Wings of a Nightingale on there, which is um, quite possibly, I think, the best song that Paul ever wrote for another artist after his Beatle days, because I, I really think he had the Everly's in mind here. The harmonies are just exquisite. Um, yeah, I like Paul's demo, but, you know, to hear Phil and, Phil and Don harmonize together on that song, it's a perfect pop song altogether. It's short. It makes you want to listen to it over and over again. It's got all the hallmarks of the great Everly Brothers songs of the 50s and 60s. Um, Kind of wish they did more work together. But no, that would definitely be on my list. And I had one more song, which, you know, if you include Badge in there, how can you not in, not include Fame with David Bowie? Okay. okay. So, you know, John co-wrote it. I don't know how much he really wrote of, of the song, really, with uh, David Bowie and um, Carlos Alomar. And um, yeah, it's that's another classic song. It's got the greatest groove, and uh, till still to this day, it's you know one of the most popular of all of David Bowie's songs in his catalog. That's the sum of the songs that fit this category of uh, of tunes that the Beatles gave to other artists. So these are all great lists. Any yeah. that uh, any of, of my choices you want to comment on? Oh, they were good choices. They were good, yeah. They were all good choices, and I, I like that you found uh, you thought of Bowie there at the end. Mm -hmm. Um, I I don't remember. Did that did Fame when it was first released? 
Did it, did John get songwriting credit, or was that something that was added on later? He did. It was always I had a single when I was a kid, and um, and it was I I had you know again memory years go by. Um, I I never thought John actually was in the songwriting credit for that, but but he was. You know, I did. I don't mean to go back to we were talking about uh, the immigrant Neil Sedaka and whatnot. And I went back looking while we were doing the show here. Uh, to try to find what I was, what my memory seemed to uh, have was that there was a single "Laughter in the Rain" with the immigrant being the B side, and there was, but it wasn't the first release. It was a reissue, and it wasn't the one I had. And I think I had the immigrant, and and not "Laughter in the Rain" because I had the album too, so it's uh -huh. probably getting mixed up. And I had the immigrant single, and I had the uh, Sedaka's back album uh, back in that day at that time. But uh, there was a re-release on MCA Records uh, that coupled, I guess, because they were both hits. One of those, you know, side by side mm. things for jukeboxes uh, that had "Laughter in the Rain" and the immigrant uh, on both sides. So just to set the record straight, um, and the immigrant is really a great song. Yeah, it is. And it's a song that applies. It's so perfect for today, considering, you know, the politics of the immigrant situation in this country, you know, and which side you lean on. But right. uh, it's uh, it's it's a timeless song for that reason. Right. But when you think even though Neil Sedaka never mentioned John Lennon in the lyrics of the song, you know, that way it could it could serve for all immigrants mm -hmm. um but he had was thinking of john he had john in mind with uh the way that he was harassed by the nixon administration at the time they wanted to have him deported and um so it was really nice that neil thought of him at that moment and wrote that song and um you know if you're not familiar with it check it out it's a really good song from neil sadaka can I mention another couple that um, were on my sort of list without the check marks next to them? Most most of them you two had mentioned, so I won't mention those, but I've got two leftovers um, from George uh, that just are worth mentioning. One is that kind of woman, Gary Moore. Um, he, that was one of, wow. one of four tracks that he wrote around the time of Run So Far and gave to Clapton. Clapton right didn't do that one so gary moore did and it's it's an interesting song uh, actually uh eric clapton did record did he that kind of woman because it's on the uh nobody's child compilation his version of it right right okay forgot that so it was originally for eric but gary moore's version is fantastic it's eric it's actually moore. better than eric's yeah and then if um you know, if six o'clock is the best thing any of the other Beatles wrote for Ringo, probably the second best thing might be I'll Still Love You that George did for him. <laughs> hmm. So those were that's the, a, yeah, that's another case. Uh, Originally, George wrote I'll Still Love You when it was called When Every Song is Sung for Scylla Black. Hmm. He had Scylla Black in mind. Then he was thinking about other people he could give it to. And um, yeah, so it's not like he thought of Ringo when he wrote the song, but he, it was a leftover song that he gave to him, but mm -hmm. still worked out really well. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, also by the same token, Paul didn't write um, 4th of July for John Christie either. John Christie thinks he did. He, he says in interviews that he did. But 4th of July dates back to that um 1970 spring 1970 ram demo when it was called why am i crying which is still That's a lyric very... in 4th of july but then it became fourth of july and uh dave clark came to visit paul and said have you got something for this guy i'm recording and paul said yeah take take this mm. so, not right written exactly for him but uh you know he he did a good job with it and paul wasn't going to use it so interesting another leftover song mm -hmm. which paul either just gave to him or perfected and did more work on mm -hmm. all right so some good lists from all three of us thank you and thank you. um you're, you're cool. 
If any of our listeners or viewers would like to comment and add some songs that we didn't mention, there's no way we can go through all of them. We'd be here for hours. Yeah, there's two. Uh, but yeah. Um, if we just had to narrow it down to five, that would be so very tough. But, uh, you know, definitely the ones that we mentioned all deserve to be in there. And uh, yeah, so if you guys watching want to comment about this and uh, love to know your thoughts about it. So before we go very quickly, let's tell the folks what we're up to. And uh, we'll start with uh, Alan. Um, mostly what I'm up to is working on volume two of McCartney legacy. I'm, I'm sort of at the moment stuck in 1974 when they're still in Nashville. I've only got a couple of days of that trip left, but it, it was so action packed that mm. uh, I seem unable to get to the end of that chapter. Um, but I'm now up to July 15th and they left on the 18th. So the end is near. Um, but then, of course, that's only mid-1974. I've got to make it up to 1980, so um, a lot of work to do. And um, otherwise, just sort of doing interviews about the book, still doing that. Um, so far, one of my favorite lines from reviews that's come up is uh, this past weekend, the Mail on Sunday reviewed it. Um, and they like uh, the, the big criticism of this book seems to be that there's too much information in it, which uh, I kind of don't understand as criticism. But uh, the one thing that that guy said was, uh, if the devil is in the detail, the McCartney legacy is positively satanic. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, you should just save that quote. Yeah, I, I, I should definitely... use that in every in every press release. That's right. a great quote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like it. <laughs> so, Darren, yeah, sorry. Yes. What are you up to? Uh, I'm up page to six. Here. Page mm -hmm. six. Whatever. Uh, I've actually torn the book. Well, I'm still working off a, 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 a PDF, um, and I have uh, basically a probably read i would guesstimate about three quarters of it but in in sections i kind of jump around um i actually have been listening to uh i got my mccartney singles box but for convenience purposes i'll admit i'm listening to it on spotify um uh, my my turntable is not in working shape right now uh and it's actually um serving as a bit of a nice kind of background thing while thumbing through through Alan's book because I'm looking for these little, you know, these little tidbits of things that uh, could fill in those blanks on these songs that I've been listening to for decades. But, um, and I can't wait for volume volume two when that happens, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Um, and that's, uh, that's basically it. Now you want to know how to um, get in touch? Sure. Yeah, the uh, face. You know what? Facebook's the best way for me. Uh, I think if you want to get in touch with me, independent of this show, I have two Facebook pages. So if you did a Google search, uh, Google search. If you did a Facebook search of Darren DeVivo, you'll find my main page, uh, and there's also a second one. Um, and join or friend me, and I'll get you on the other page, and we'll be connected. So uh, go look for those pages, and as for WFUV. I, I was off for a couple of weeks over the holidays. And in fact, tonight, we're recording this again on Wednesday the 4th. Tonight is my first um, time back on the radio. First time in 2023. Uh, and you could catch me Monday through Thursday night, starting at 10 p.m. till 2 a.m. and Saturday afternoons from 1 to 4. And that's 90.7 FM in New York City. And uh, we're streaming at WFUV.org. And we have an app you can download. Two ways you can listen anywhere. And uh, so that's that's my story. All right. Very good. As for me, uh, I'll make this really brief. And I think from now on, we're going to have in our description box all these links. Where if you want to listen to Darren's show, if you want to listen to my radio show, uh, you know. Everything that we talk about at the end of our shows, we're going to wrap up 
and, and include in the description box to make it easier for you. Uh, my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com, every week has Beatles trivia. And um, you can win the McCartney Legacy, Volume 1, Alan's book, Alan and Adrian. And uh, in addition to that, Ringo Live at the Greek Theater 2019, the new book from Laurie Jacobson, Top of the Mountain, The Beatles at Shea Stadium in 1965. Starting next week, I'll be giving away copies of um, Chris Englehart's new book, Fully Uncovered, dealing with Beatles side projects and songs that they wrote for other people, like we talked about here. Uh, my YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, I just did another interview with Chris Englehart. We talked about five uh Beatles side projects including a song that John Lennon co-wrote with Johnny Gentle mm. the guy that the Beatles backed in Scotland in 1960 and uh that's on my YouTube channel as is a new interview with Ken McNabb Ken is the author of and in the end the last days of the Beatles which came out in 2019 and the brand new book called you started it which is all about rock and roll feuds. There's one chapter in his book about John and Paul, which we talk about there. I also wanted to get his own take since his book, and in the end, dealt with 1969 in detail. I wanted to know what Ken thought of Peter Jackson's Get Back since the book came out before the documentary and if it changed his perception of what, what happened that month in January and what unraveled in the year so that's uh, on my youtube channel ken michaels radio there's going to be a lot of new interviews in the next couple of weeks including one which will have darren on it okay my uh radio show every little thing my weekly syndicated show if you want to listen to it there's one place where you can listen on demand and that's at wfdu's radio uh wfdu's website wfdu.fm and um, click on the show, Every Little Thing. It will have two shows on there. Um, the last two shows that were broadcast at the radio station. And you can listen to them. They're available for two weeks each. And then finally, my other uh, Beatles podcast, talk show podcast called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. Uh, the next show will be Monday, January 9th. It's a live broadcast, 9 p.m. Eastern Time on our YouTube channel. We'll be talking about the songs from John Lennon that were that are unreleased and songs um, that were not released while he was alive. So that means we can include Free as a Bird and Real Love and those songs and songs that were on the john lennon anthology and whatnot so um we're going to delve deeply into those songs are there any songs that you think are really strong that john didn't release because you never know if he might have used any of those songs parts of those songs in future songs that he was going to write you just don't know it's so one thing you discover about a lot of those unreleased songs is how he borrowed bits from some songs and used them and other songs later but anyway that's what's happening with me if you want to get in touch with me directly my email address is every little thing at att.net and that wraps things up for our very first show of 2023 we hope you enjoyed it thanks to all of you for watching on behalf of alan darren and myself ken michaels we are things we said today thanks for watching and we'll see you next time